This week on Popular Hot Rodding Television, Cam and Dean discuss how clutches and manual transmissions work and how they've changed over the years. Your Dear Cam and Dean questions will be answered, and Mike Moran and his outrageous quad turbo drag car will be the subject of our driver profile. Stay tuned. One time in go kart camp, I took a shifter. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> ooh, 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 what? <laughs> nice, Masacha. We can't be talking about shifters. Well, actually, we really should, but nowhere near in that regard. Welcome to Popular Hot Running Television. I'm Cameron Evans. And I'm Dean Scusa. Now, the reason why it's appropriate to talk about shifters, not like what he's talking about, but today's episode focuses on clutches and manual transmissions. Now, a lot of guys out there can make a lot of horsepower, but it's the clutch that actually applies this horsepower. I mean, what good is making a ton of horsepower if you're not getting it to the ground? Now, chances are the muscle car of your dreams didn't ship with an automatic. This particular 70 Challenger here was restored by Muscle Car Restorations in Wisconsin, and it's got parts from year one of tip to tail. It's a great restoration. Now, this car originally was not a 446 pack car. It had a four barrel on it, but the owner said, heck, let's change it. You would never do that when it comes to the transmission. Now, the clutch to go with this manual transmission, it's actually pretty interesting. Let's see how it works. The typical automotive clutch uses a disc type design. One disc is fastened to the flywheel and the other, called a clutch disc, is connected to the transmission input shaft. The clutch disc moves back and forth, engaging and disengaging the flywheel. As the clutch disc makes contact with the flywheel, friction causes the clutch disc to spin and quickly the two mate and spin at the same speed. A common clutch setup consists of a pilot bearing, flywheel, clutch disc, pressure plate, throw-out bearing, throw-out lever, and clutch housing. The pilot bearing provides support for the transmission input shaft in the end of the crankshaft. The flywheel provides a mating surface for the clutch disc. The clutch disc is lined on both sides with a heat-resistant friction material. Located between the two sides of the clutch disc is the facing spring, a thin, flat piece of metal that allows the friction surfaces to bend a little to control clutch chatter when the clutch disc first contacts the flywheel. A series of coil damping springs located toward the center of the clutch disc help control vibration. The pressure plate is bolted to the flywheel and uses either a coil or diaphragm spring setup to provide the tremendous force that's required to push the clutch disc against the flywheel. The pressure plate keeps the clutch disc and thus the transmission connected to the engine at all times, except when the driver pushes down on the clutch pedal in the car. When the pedal is depressed, a series of rods and levers actuate the throwout lever. The throwout lever pushes the throwout bearing against the springs on the pressure plate, releasing the force holding the clutch disc against the flywheel. This causes the clutch disc to separate or disengage from the flywheel, and no power is transferred to the transmission. Many modern clutch designs use a hydraulic system to assist the driver in disengaging the clutch from the flywheel. Now that you see a little bit more about how a clutch actually works, you see that friction that comes from that initial part of slipping of the clutch, that builds a lot of heat, and heat is your enemy. It'll wear your clutch out. Now, this particular clutch is from an LS1 application, like a C5 Corvette or an F-Body, like a Camaro or a Firebird, and they're notorious for wearing the clutches out of them. Those LS1s make a lot more power than the old-school motors. Now, Center Force, who's one of the greatest names in the clutch business, one of their most popular items is a replacement clutch for LS1 applications, because they put a lot of technology into these clutches to try to make them not wear out. They've mounted this one on this little Lazy Susan where you can see actual construction of the clutch. One of the secrets is this carbon layer in here because it allows you to put a lot more clamping load on the clutch without wearing it out. It can dissipate heat. Now, something else that Center Force has done, it goes back to when Bill Hayes invented this type of clutch, is this weight system. And what it does is it takes away that association with heavy pedal effort that used to go on with cars like our Challenger. Now, you can have lots of clamping load, put as much as six or 700 horsepower to the ground, and have a light, easy clutch pedal. 
Now, why the heck do they call it a lazy Susan when a guy named Eric actually invented it? Go figure. Now, another type of clutch, and probably the easiest to understand actually how it operates, is a lever clutch or a finger clutch like this haze. You can see that it utilizes three levers that actually get slung outward with centrifugal force. This is actually how it creates its pressure on the pressure plate. You'll also notice that it uses coil springs rather than a diaphragm to actually achieve its or get closer to one-to-one. -to -one. Now, the same principles apply in a top fuel clutch or a go-kart clutch as this haze. Speaking of top fuel clutches, Don Lampus was cool enough to lend us his five-disc AFT setup so we could really get a good visual and see how it works. You'll notice no uh, counterweight on the, on the levers there, Don. What, you don't want to give away any of your cool speed secrets? Now, when I say that works principally the same as a haze, actually, the first second of a, let's say, a top fuel or a funny car run, it's identical. We have six levers rather than three, but the same exact principle. These levers are working with any centrifugal force, so even at an idle, these are the levers that are operating. Now, where it differs is, is in the 12 multi-levers, or lock-up levers. Since we don't run a transmission, this clutch does a brunt of the duty. I mean, for the first 2.3 to 2.5 seconds, this thing's sliding like crazy, and then we get one-to-one. -one. Now, how do we get one-to-one? -one? Well, we have an air over hydraulic throw-up bearing that rides on these lock-up levers. You can see this lever here. It's not doing anything until it actually the heel of the lever actually rides on the carbide of the pressure plate. Then it applies the force. It doesn't do anything until it gets to that predetermined height. Now, these things take a lot of abuse. Let me tell you, they actually glow red after a run. I mean, 6,500 horsepower, and the thing's sliding like crazy. A lot of service, too. New facings are put on between every five and six runs, and all the five discs in the four floaters, gone. They're garbage. Now, later in the show, we'll talk about manual transmissions. Coming up on Popular Hot Rodding Television, we'll discuss how the manual transmission works, and Cam and Dean answer your questions. Hey, welcome back. Well, now it's time for our first installment of Dear Cam and Dean, where we actually address all the snail mail and the email we get around here, and we get a lot. Yeah, some of them are kind of stupid, but that'll be for you to judge, I guess, actually. Now, this one comes from Joe, i got to get this right, Joe Kanochik. Okay, it says, hi, guys, great show and great bantering between Cam and Dean. It says, I've got an idea. How about one show, all of the past video valet gals and the associated car is at a big party somewhere, and he wants to be invited. What do you think? I'll tell you what, I mean, I don't think they'd show up. I mean, like we'd really want them at our party anyway. They got attitudes. I want them. I'm single. You're married. I'll take it if I can get it. Take what? Never mind. <laughs> all right. You well, let's go on to the next piece of mail, all right? Now, this one comes from Victor, and I'm not even going to try his last name. And he writes, I wonder if someone can give me details on making flames come out of my exhaust pipes on my 53 Merc. Well, Vic, I could tell you one thing. How about 100% nitro? I mean, it might only happen once, but it'll be big. Well, no, that's not actually right. I mean, you've got to use 20% methanol so that you can get the car started, and then it'll happen once. Well, no, there's actually kits available for it. I mean, that's really an old-school thing. I mean, you've got a 53 Merc, so I know where you're going with that. I mean, in the 50s, guys used to actually put, like, a, a spark plug in the exhaust pipe, turn the ignition off, pump the thing up, get it all rich. But there's kits available out there. Yeah, not a rich. Okay, this next one's from Denny Maxwell. He says, uh, I gotta ask the dumb question of the day. We'll be the judge of that. <laughs> because last week your show was all about turbochargers and how great they are. But if they're all that great, how come all the big straps use blowers? He says, maybe you addressed that and I was getting a cup of coffee or sleeping. Uh, I still like my blower anyway. Am I a strap? I guess you are now. Actually, <laughs> that's not necessarily true. Where the guys that race, you know, top fuel dragsters and funny cars like Scusa, yeah, they've got superchargers. But the best guys right now in street legal drag racing use the most efficient power adder, a turbocharger. Now, if you want to do it on your own car, you pretty much got to go with a blower because it's the only thing you can get a kit. Nitrous works too. Okay, this one uh, comes to us from. Now, this one's really silly. I ain't going to bother with that one. This one comes to us from Dan, and he writes. This question might be a little off the wall, but where do you guys get those cool retro shirts? The ones with the decorative stripes down each side. They remind me of a lot of the old bowling shirts. I'd like to order some, thanks. Well, Dan, we get them from Steady Clothing, and they are cool. A lot of guys wear them like Titus, and you'll see these things everywhere. They're, they really got that, if you ever saw that Rodney Dangerfield film, uh, what was it? Uh, Easy money. Yeah, with the regular guy look. The regular guy look. That's what this is all about. Well, actually, you can go to www.phrtv.com and find anything you see on the walls here, from our shoes to our shirts to our posters, and buy it for yourself. 
Well, cool. Well, how do you think the first uh, segment of Dear Cam and Dean went? Fair. Fair. We'll be right back. There are some crazy ones. You're right. No, there's some crazier ones. Just wait. Still to come on popular hot rodding television, we'll discuss how the manual transmission works and profile Mike Moran and his quad turbo. Stay tuned. Welcome back to popular hot rodding television and our episode all about manual transmissions and clutches. Earlier in the show, we showed you exactly how a clutch works. Now it's time to get into the gearboxes. Now this first generation Camaro is a great example of a G machine that all teenagers would love to have. He had a four speed transmission before and has swapped to a six speed, a T56. That six gear's got an overdrive, so it gets great mileage and it can put up with the power made by this 406 small block. Let's take a lot closer look at how a manual transmission actually works. The transmission controls the torque and speed of the drive wheels in relation to the engine crankshaft. Without it, getting a car moving from a standstill is almost impossible. Now let's review gear ratio basics. When a small gear turns a larger one, torque increases but overall speed decreases. And when a large gear drives a small one, torque decreases but overall speed increases. And herein lies the magic of the manual transmission. Let's take a look at a basic three-speed, but keep in mind that most four, five, and six-speeds operate in the same fashion. Inside, we find four shafts. The input shaft is driven by the clutch. The output shaft connects to the input shaft, but rotates independently. Located below are a counter shaft and a reverse idler shaft. Mounted on these shafts are a number of gears, along with synchronizers. A set of shift forks fit into the grooves in the synchronizer sleeve. The forks are attached to either a shift rail or linkage rods, which are attached to the gear shift lever. On our three-speed transmission, the output shaft achieves a gear ratio of about 3 to 1 for first gear and reverse, about 2 to 1 for second gear, and 1 to 1 for third gear. Here's how it's done. In neutral, power from the input shaft is transferred by way of the third gear down to the counter gear shaft, which rotates all of the other gears on the output shaft. But because none of them are locked to the output shaft, they spin freely and no power is transferred. When you select first gear, the shift fork slides the first reverse synchronizer over to lock first gear to the output shaft, and power is transferred. When second gear is selected, the second third synchronizer moves over and locks second gear to the output shaft. For third gear, the second third synchronizer moves over and locks the input shaft directly to the output shaft to achieve the final gear ratio of one to one. Oh, and for reverse, the first reverse synchronizer moves over and engages the reverse gear. The change in output shaft rotation is achieved by the fact that the reverse idler gear drives reverse gear and not the counter shaft directly. In the old days, manual transmissions were not fully synchronized and changing gears, especially downshifting into first, produced loud grinding noises as the gears tried to mesh. The synchronizers allow for smooth shifting. When the synchronizer moves into an output gear, the synchronizer cone contacts the gear first, and the cone and gear begin turning at the same speed, allowing the teeth on the gears to mesh cleanly. Well, now that you see how they work, now it's time to select the gearbox for your vehicle. Now, the biggest issue you're going to have when it comes to selecting one is, does it fit my car? I mean, it's really that simple. You can see we have three of them here. We got the Muncie, Old Faithful a T5 and a T56, you can see that they're all different lengths and different sizes. So it's really an issue of overall length, the tunneling of the actual gearbox, and the cross member. I mean, is that location going to be right? Plus, you're going to probably have to fit your drive shaft. You know, there's some shops around that can help you with the, the overall length of that. Another thing is select the bell housing that fits your car, too. It's not just an adapter that goes between the block and the gearbox. It's also a safety device. So if you're going to do any type of competitive racing, 
you're probably going to be required to have an SFI certified bell housing like this one from Lakewood. Now, I don't know if you ever saw a clutch come out of a car, but man, it is not pretty. Now, in the tech segment earlier, we showed you a basic three-speed manual transmission. The four-speed works on the same principle, where the final gear, fourth gear, is working at a one-to-one -one ratio, so the engine and the drive shaft are going at the same speed. With a five-speed or a six-speed, that final gear is an overdrive. In this case, fourth gear would be one-to-one, -one, and fifth gear would be at the overdrive, making the engine run at a lower speed than the rear tires. That's going to get you better mileage. Same case with the six-speed. Fifth gear is one-to-one, -one, and six-speed is the overdrive. Now, let's say you look at these transmissions and you go, you know what, my mechanical skills aren't up to swapping out a transmission, but I already have a manual gearbox. Think about changing the fluid. You can make the transmission shift a lot smoother and last a lot longer. Also, you can swap out the shifter. You can get something with a little shorter throw. I mean, I got this really bad mental image of you and shifters. I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Speaking of shifting gears, let's go to this week's rotting marketplace. For 35 years, k &N Performance Filters has been delivering performance and protection. Whether it's the replacement k &N Air Filter, the new technology k &N Performance Gold Oil Filter, the Fuel Injection Performance Kit, or the k &N Typhoon Intake System, k &N delivers performance out of the box. To learn more about the world's best filters, visit us on the web or call today. Redline Oil's complete line of performance lubricants are proven by the pros. From our famous power-producing engine oils to our shock-proof gear lubes and famed water-wetter coolant additive, Redline provides guaranteed performance and protection. Check out our website at redlineoil.com or call toll-free for the power you deserve. Get the Edelbrock catalog by calling 800-FUN-TEAM. Inside, you'll find the world of performance that Edelbrock has brought you for over 60 years, including over 55 new products like crate engines, E-Tech cylinder heads, shock absorbers, and more manifolds than ever before. Edelbrock has one of the most extensive performance lines in the industry. You know the number, 800-FUN-TEAM. Mike Moran and his Quad Turbo Monster are next on Popular Hot Rodding Television. Welcome back to PHR-TV. Earlier in the year, Scusa and I went down to Orlando, like we always do, for the World Street Nationals. And this time around, we picked up some driver profiles. We got Mike Moran here. He's one of the original Pro Street legends. Well, Cam, you know what they say about pioneers. You end up with a lot of arrows in your butt, you know, but only for a little while. John Meany and Mike Moran got together, built a 2,200-horsepower car, four turbochargers, and we were there to see him shake it down. Check it out. If two turbos are good, four should be better. That's what Mike Moran thought as he tweaked Casper, his 95 Pro Street 442 big block for the Orlando World Street Nationals. We caught up with his crew for the biggest race of the year. We tried something different for this year. Myself and John Meany uh, developed this uh, quad turbo engine and it's the first of its kind. So we're, we're expecting a few bugs here. It's, it's debut here and we're trying to work out the bugs here right now. We wouldn't have brung it out because it really wasn't ready, but it was the last race of the year. It is the biggest race, and we figured it's better to bring it out and at least debut it. The car in this race, first the car is, you know, the only car still running, you know, from the original days, 93 and 94. And it's uh, the only car that, you know, hasn't been replaced and phased out every single year by another newer car. And, and it's got a lot of nostalgia to it and a lot of history. It's the first car ever to go six seconds to one mile an hour. You like to do stuff that's prototype and experiment. So. You know, next year, the motor's done. All we got to do is work the bugs out, and I think we'll be able to campaign it more next year and still keep the customers happy. There's obviously, by first glance, there's a lot of work to the induction. It's different. It's obvious that it's not like any other motor there. Also, it's utilizing a set of heads and a block that nobody else uses other than in some different classes that don't pertain to this. It's very relatively short deck height, short stroke, very high RPM. Uh, it, there's some differences between that and what I build for other people, so it's going to be a few bugs there to work out. What makes the class special originally, and still a small part of it, is the diversity of power plants, the diversity of any ma manufactured body you want to use, Ford, Chrysler, Chevy, it doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter, you don't have to have a new car, you can have an old car. It's the diversity that's nice, and the fact that it retains a lot of stock body features. The most challenging part this year for me is been a new combination that's never been done before and you're always into the pitfalls that, that you're not expecting that you, it'd be different if I'd done you know one of my customers motors three or four times but this this has a lot of unforeseen it, it, a small job can turn into a week 
Unfortunately, problems with the valve train prevented Mike and his quad turbo from qualifying. But don't be surprised if this duo sets the pace in 2002. Well, we're out of time. Hopefully they learned something about clutches and trannies today. Now, the big question is, what kind of transmission does Scooza's tank have? High gear only, baby. Yeah, our friends at Aero Hobby supply us with these really cool 1 16th scale tanks, and we're going to have a little Battelle Royale here. We'll see you next week. Right. Just remember, mine's got reverse, too. <laughs> yeah, well, so does mine. I'm going to blast. I'm going to oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, <we> got... <laughs> I think I've got more battery than you do. I know what you're thinking. Did he fire five or did he fire six? To tell you the truth with all this TP, I kind of lost track myself. But you have to ask yourself one question. See, now I got a little place to hide. Do I feel lucky? Well, do you, punk? <laughs> <laughs> Next week on Popular Hot Rodding Television. Cam and Dean, with a little help from the Mullet Brothers, will explain once and for all how the automatic transmission works. The competition is hot and furious at the Good Guys Show in Columbus, Ohio. And why did this awesome 67 Nova win Street Machine of the Year honors? Tune in and find out. Subscribe to Popular Hot Rodding Magazine, your source for the rod and performance scene, and save 75% off the single copy rate. Each supercharged issue is packed with killer muscle cars and street rods, the latest performance parts, and tuning tips to make your car look cooler and go faster. Plus, if you order now, you'll receive the latest issue of Popular Hot Rodding absolutely free. If you like what you see, you'll pay only $9.97 for 11 more issues. America's performance publication, Popular Hot Rodding. To order, call 877-9-RODDER today. If you'd like more information on popular hot rodding television and the products presented on the show, visit phrtv.com.